Hello everyone and thanks for joining us tonight for our In Focus event with Julie Cumming and Sean Moravsky. Um, hi everyone, hi Julie, hi Sean. Um, let me just check that your audio and stuff on, can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so tonight we are going to be hearing from both Julie and Sean um, on some of their recent self-published uh, zines and books. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please do put them into the chat feature on Facebook um, and we'll have some time at the end to put some of those questions to the artists. Um, and as well, if you can't, um, if you want to share this talk further, we'll be uploading it to our YouTube over the weekend as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Julie Cumming. Uh, Julie is a photographer and writer uh, and designer based in Blair Athol in Highland, Perthshire. Since graduating from product design at Duncan of Jordanson, Dundee in 2018, she's worked on a number, on a number of multidisciplinary projects across writing, graphic design, interior design and photography. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about uh, some of the publications you've been working on recently, Julie. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me as well. Oh, that's great. I'm going to share the screen. Perfect. So as John said, I'm a designer and photographer based in Highland, Perthshire. Um, my creative practice often has quite a human-based um, focus to it because I studied product design at DJ CAD in Dundee and we had a user-centred course there for the whole four years so it's something that I've tried to bring into my freelance work and my photography and things. Um, my most recent photography projects have both involved self-publishing as John said and that's what I'm going to speak to you about this evening. So earlier this year I released a zine called Abstract Cities Details from Urban Spaces on Film um, and it's really it's the first film photography zine that I've put together and had professionally printed. I mean, I've been making zines since 2018 um, when I was at art school. That's where I learned how to do them. Um, and this is really just um, together of all my urban photography since 2016. Um, so when I'm shooting in urban environments, I'm drawn to the details of buildings, things like the colour, typography, brickwork, concrete, and also the details of things that are going on around me. Uh, so whether it's interactions between people or street performers and things like that. And I think that's because up until I moved to Dundee for university in 2014, I'd always lived really rurally, so I didn't spend a lot of time in towns and cities. And I found that focusing on little details helped me stop any anxieties that I would have about being in a big bustling place. It made me view the city as a different kind of place. It was a creative canvas. It was something for me to slow down and just focus on that rather than being <laughs> lost in the hustle and bustle of it being such a wee country girl. Um, so that really helped for me. Um, and Abstract Cities was put together after, during the lockdown, I'd kind of started to feel a wee bit disconnected from photography. I hadn't been out going to, uh, taking pictures so much um, I'd just been, you know, I'd just been scrolling through Instagram and things like that and just consuming photography at a really quick rate, but not actually remembering any of it or taking it improperly. Because I think it's so easy to just sit and scroll and like things, but not actually really thinking about the photographs themselves. And that's a shame because the stuff I was seeing was too good. So I realised I was missing seeing work in print and more specifically in galleries and photo books and exhibitions and things like that. So I decided that I would put together a wee zine and see how that goes, um, <laughs> see if people are interested. But if not, it was more about connecting with photography and connecting with the photographic world as well, because through this scene, I've found so many other film photographers in Scotland and things, it's been really inspiring. So it's probably the best thing about it, actually. Mm. So, so I'd never really sequenced anything before and like this whenever I'd made zines at uni it was always kind of collage pieces or just something that I quickly made on the photocopier in the uni library and got charged a ton for um, so it was nice for this one to actually gather up all of my urban film photographs and get them printed out and I think there was probably about 90 um, that, I'd <laughs> that I'd found from over the years um, get them all printed out professionally and kind of just lay them on the floor and then cluster them and then try and pair them within that clusters and really ask myself what were the connections and how you know how, why did these pictures sit together and things like that so it was good 
for reconnecting that way and making you think about photography in more of a way than just a, a simple snapshot. It was more about well, why does that image have that feel to it. Um, so it was really good for that actually. And I eventually narrowed it down to, well, first of all, I've done 48 because I was thinking of it in spreads rather than pages. So I thought 24 spreads, that'll be fine. But then actually when it came down to the printing costs, I realised that it, it was going to be 24 pages, not 24 spreads. <laughs> so that was good as well, because it really forced me to cut it down even more, to curate it even further than what it already was. And in the end, I went with a theme that kind of drew on colours and details. So there would be a wee glimpse of red coming in, then the pictures after that would have red, and then it would be a wee glimpse of brickwork, and then the pictures after that would have theme of brickwork, and then it was typography and neon lighting and things like that. So it really, the zine was about the details of urban spaces and more than just the pictures, it was the details that drew the sequencing really. Um, so that's an example of with the brickwork and things and you can see in this image here on the right, that's where the typography really starts to come in and that's actually in Glasgow as well, so some of you will recognise that, um, a very good place to be. <laughs> so this is the picture in the zine where the red starts to come in. Um, I took this in Liverpool in 2017. We were on a university trip and I'd never been to Liverpool before. Um, I'd had some rolls of Kodak Colour Plus and Fuji C200. Um, I decided that I was going to try and shoot as much as I could, even though it was a whistle stop tour. So you were kind of like rapidly looking around for these details again so that it could calm down and slow down the anxieties that I might have had. Um, what I liked about here was just having the pocket fun with the statue trying to hold up the Radio City um, big pillar there. And you can see in the left hand side of this image, there's still the big looming building of the metropolis. I was still feeling kind of like the, this was the big unknown city, but then outweighing that is the calm of the sky and things and then the fun. So I think it was a sign that taking pictures was really helping me. And this is the image where the wee flash of red comes in. Down at the bottom, we've got the traffic light and the, the lettering on the shop. So when I'm saying that the scene was driven by colour and things, that's how minute the detail it can be, just a tiny wee bit, but that was all it needed to drive. So I think when people are looking at the zine, it's maybe not always obvious what the sequence was, but I hope that it'd be easy for people to look at and that there wouldn't be any kind of harsh contrast in what was coming next. It was always kind of driven by a thought. Um, also, when we were on that trip, we went to London, which was amazing. I'd never been there before. Um, we visited a lot of design studios, the design festival as well, which was great. And again, it was so much to take in. I think I must have about six or seven rolls of film from that one trip alone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were just running through the streets, basically, because that's how tight our schedule was for things. Um, and one of these journeys involved going on the London Underground. And for me, this was unlike anything I'd ever been on before. I've been on the Glasgow subway and I love it, but the underground was totally different. It was such a big upgrade from that and the and amount of people that were there. So I think this image really captures how I felt at that time. I think this was the first stop that we'd been at. And I kind of, I wanted to try and capture the chaos of it, as well as I think the beauty of the colours and things down there as well. And you've got the, the really lovely, um, underground signs and things. So as much as it is chaotic, I can still focus on these details and things and appreciate them. Um, I'm, I think hopefully my um, the overwhelming nature of it came through in the chaos of what's going on. So in the very background, we've got people that are waiting to board. We've got the slight signs that you can see. We can kind of make out that we're on the High Street Kensington. And then as you come in, we've got the people that are in the carriage and you don't really know what any of them are doing, who's looking where, what are they up to, where are they going, what's their plans, who are they? And then even further forward than that, I don't know if you can make out just in the middle is a reflection of who's all standing on the platform that I was and you can kind of see me and my friends there. Um, so it was nice in that respect that it brings back memories of who I was with at that time, but also the kind of <laughs> immense, immense experience that it was. And then you contrast that with the view that I just turned, just, you know, turned the slightest bit and out of the subway station, I could see this green bloom of a tree. And it was something that was a lot more familiar and it brought a real sense of nature and calm. 
um, to a place that was so uncommon, unnatural, really. So that's that, in that photo, you I kind of wanted to emphasise the big differences there between my mood. So this um, was taken very far from London. It was in Dundee. Um, it was one of the first pictures that I shot on film successfully. It was on a little AGFA 535 viewfinder camera, yeah, which is just a little boxy camera from the 70s. It's got very little controls. You can set the focus and you can set the ISO, but that's all. You can't set the shutter speed or the aperture. So you kind of have to trust it a wee bit. And I just picked it up that day in a wee um, reuse shop for £3. It wasn't tested or anything like that, but it did have the case, which I thought was probably a good sign because that means that somebody's looked after it pretty well. So I got some batteries for it in a wee shop and went along into the Keeler Centre, which is one of my favourite places in Dundee. It's a wee shopping centre, I think it was built in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, and it's just filled with nice typography, like you can see here, and it's got really funky kind of lighting. Um, all the shops look like they've been totally unchanged since it was built. Even the bins and things in there look totally unchanged. It's like you're stepping back in time. And what I liked about this image is that Firstly, I was shooting just in case the camera would work, so I thought, well, I'll get the just in case because that'll be a nice reminder for me that maybe it will work, maybe it won't. Um, I think only half the roll came out, but that was probably due to me, not the camera. I'll, <laughs> I'll let it off this time. And I liked how the, um, there was that much typography to take in. With being a designer, that's one of the things that I always spot when I'm out and about is typography and what fonts are they and things like that. So it's probably quite boring, but <laughs> there you go. Um, and I liked how the red from the poster was emulated in the wee fire bell up at the top there. So that was really my reasoning behind that one. And on the other end of the scale, we have a book called From Home, which I published in November last year. And it took a year to make this book. And it's basically, it's a collection of people's stories of living in the area of Athol. So Athol, I would say, is all these kind of little towns, just in Perthshire, just, I would, I call it right halfway between Perth and Aviemore, basically. So you've got a whole range of different communities and things that are living in there. Um, and I work in a, a wee cafe seasonally, and we have all the locals coming in, and they're always laughing and joking about what they used to do when they were children, or what it was like, say, 20 years ago, and they're really nice stories to hear. And I realised that nobody's really capturing these little conversations and things, and it's a real snapshot of Scottish social history in this area. So if you're not having these conversations, you're not going to know what it was like. You can know as much as museums will tell you, but in terms of what people would say is the mundane, everyday things, you don't really learn so much. And I thought it was a shame that this was being lost, so I decided to put together the book. Um, and it was, it was quite a privilege to put it together, actually, because I was being trusted with people's stories, <laughs> you know, their stories and memories. So I wanted to try and do it in a way that was very human, um, that would be preserved for years to come and things like that. So it was a great, great project to be involved with that. And everyone was kind and letting me share their stories and really open and supportive of it, which was great. So when it came to the interviews for in my book, um, I just I started thinking about what questions I could ask people. And some of the um, contributors, I knew them quite well, but the other ones I didn't know quite so well. So I was struggling with what questions to ask people and how to really get their stories. And then I stripped it back and I thought, OK, what if the person that I was interviewing could direct the story and the conversation as to how they wanted it? You know, what did they want to share about their childhood? Who did they want to remember? And really, what did they find was most important about growing up here? So I asked everybody the same things. I just asked them, when did you come here? What did you do here? And what has changed? And it's amazing that some conversations lasted about two and a half hours. <laughs> and then there were some that were 40 minutes, but you got the same level of richness within each. You know, there were some people that would remember really descriptive memories and really vivid things. And there's other ones that couldn't quite remember the dates and things, but that didn't matter because they remembered the essence and the routine of what they did. And I think that was what was most important for me. Um, and when people were asking me, they said, oh, what questions have you got me? And they were quite surprised and almost relieved, I think, to find that it was such easy questions and open-ended ones. It was more like a conversation in an interview. And I didn't really know how to put it until I was watching a 
photography documentary on Platon the other week. And I think he summed it up really nicely when he was speaking about when he does his portraits, no matter who it is, they're all sitting on the same box. They've all got the same backdrop. He uses the same cameras, the same films, the same editing equipment. And he explained it as everything stays the same and that allows the message to change. And I think that when I heard that, I thought, yes, that's, that's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying to do really was with, with this, because I had contributors that had moved to Blair Athol from Israel 20 years ago. I had people that had been born here in the 1930s. I had people that had moved from Glasgow, from Inverness, all over the place. So everyone had totally different backgrounds. So I was giving them this level playing field that they were all on the same level. They could share whatever they wanted to. So at first I pictured it as a book, a wee bit like Humans of New York. It would have these beautiful portraits of people and then it would have sort of stories alongside it. And as by the time I'd been thinking about the photography, I mainly had all the interviews done, I had all the written pieces done, because that's how I kind of structured it in my head. I wanted to get because it was such a big job of self-publishing it, which I hadn't really <laughs> I hadn't really I'd underestimated that a wee bit, but it was all good fun. But so I kind of put it into chunks and I thought, get the writing done and then do the photography. And that's what I was probably most excited about was the photography. And by this stage I had little sketches drawn of what I imagined each person's portrait to be like. So what they were going to be wearing, what they were going to be doing at that time, what landscape they were going to be in. Because I thought this is them. This is how we show them as a person. But that ground to a halt when it turned out that everybody here was really shy or didn't want their portrait taken and put in a book, which is fair enough because we didn't know how big this book was going to be, where it was going to go all over the world or not. So I didn't want to be putting anybody in an uncomfortable position and it was already really good of them to give their stories. So I just thought, okay, it's fine. So again, I had to strip back the idea and I realized that probably enough of the person comes through in the stories because they are so human in the way that they've been told. And I didn't censor them or anything like that. I didn't change the way that people had said things. It was all very much as it sounded on the tape recorder or whatever you would call it now. That's quite outdated material, but there we go. <laughs> um, so I decided that maybe what would be helpful would be for actually the places to be shown because it's all very well for somebody that lives here. They would know when we're speaking about class, class, what house we mean, but actually we mean this little white house in the middle of Glen Tilt here. So it's, I thought it'd be useful to show people and to give them a wee, a wee bit of context because a lot of the stories demanded a wee bit of context you needed to understand just how vast a space it was or just how small a space it was, how old a building, how new, things like that. And I think probably one of the best examples that this has happened in the book is with the stories based in Glen Tilt. Um, I grew up in Glen Tilt, so I know it quite well. So it was really good fun to go up there. I haven't been there since, I didn't, haven't lived there since I was about 10 or 12. So it was nice to go with this new set of eyes kind of thing. Um, and see just how big a space it is. Because I think when you're a child, everything seems massive. But when I went back and realized, no, it really is a massive, beautiful place. So with this picture, I wanted to capture just how big a space it is and also how welcoming it is in a way with this U-shaped valley that just kind of slides down itself. There's no harshness to look at it. There's no craggy rocks. There's no big sharp mountains or anything. It's all very soft and welcoming and quite soothing, I think, to look at. And you can see um, that there's the wee lines through the hills where there's been sheep and the odd quad bike. You can see the rubble of old settlements that have been there. You can see the size of the houses in terms of everything else. You can see the trees. You can just see everything about the Glen. You can almost hear the water, which I think if you hadn't seen that and you didn't know Glen Tilt, you would kind of read the stories and be like, you know, it's a Glen. Come on, deal with it. But I think when I read you this next wee bit, you'll you'll understand. So this was a lady called Carolyn. Um, she lived in Glen Tilt in the 1950s, so it was very different days to now, um, when there was little black Ford cars and tractors and things to try and get up the Glen, but they were stuck in for months in the winter. And she explained that there was no bathroom in the house, it was an outside toilet, there was cold running water, no electricity. My father didn't drive, as people generally didn't drive at that time. The estate provided my dad with a motorbike and on a Saturday, my mother and father would go down the Glen for the messages, he with his game bag on his back. So I think that story would have been, yeah, it's great on its own, but I think to actually see where they lived 
and how far a journey it was on the Saturday down the glen on the motorbike with your shopping, trying to get that back up the road, eggs, milk, everything. Um, I think that was, so that was when I started to realise that, yeah, having the place actually is a lot more helpful perhaps than having a portrait. Because although people are really important, it doesn't matter what they look like at this point. It's what their stories are. Their spirit comes through in the stories rather than their, their faces and things. Another spot that I wanted to share in Glen Tilt is this tin house. Um, it's one of my favourite places from my childhood. So I was really excited to get in touch with the guy who actually lived there. He was the last family to stay there in the 1950s. And there's not a lot known about this tin house actually on the estate. We don't know when it was built. We assume it was post 1900, but there's no records really. And we don't know why it was built in tin um, out, of all, <laughs> out of all the materials. But I think there's something nice about how the tin has aged and just how it sits in the landscape. You know, it's so man-made looking and then it contrasts with the really nice supple grass and the soft rolling hills and things. There's something about it that if you read about a tin house, you would probably think of something that was all battered up and bashed, but it's actually aged quite gracefully and it's almost you can still get a sense of how it used to be a family home and it's still welcoming and the reds and the greens and the blues are so nice. It's almost like a little art project that someone, someone's put in the middle of the glen. So again, I think it was somewhere that was really important to capture, to show, to show just what people lived like. You know, they didn't have the great comforts, but they made it their way of living and they loved it up there. That's one of the things that comes through is that no matter any of the stories in the book, no matter how how few things they had or how little technology they had. I mean, there wasn't actually electricity in Glen Tilt until about 1975, 1980, which is way behind anywhere else. <laughs> and when I stayed up there, there was no TV signal. We only had channels one and two. We had to walk to the top of this hill actually to a little antenna and sort that if the TV went fuzzy. So it's like a, it's like a different world there. And I think you had to see that really. Um, and my third place I'm going to show from the book is Hercules Garden. Um, and this is, Hercules Garden is within the grounds of Blair Castle, um, which I'm sure many people will have been to. And I think it was a nice to show this view of it because the castle and gardens are closed in the winter. So I'm just lucky that because I live in the area, I can get there in the winter. So firstly, seeing it in the snow isn't something really that people see a lot. Um, and it's... Secondly, it was something that we, I spoke to Sarah, the estate trustee, um, and she had great stories about when people used to curl on the ponds here. So again, it would have been like 1950s, 1960s time, and she spoke about when they used to curl after work. And yeah, everybody curled at that time on the ponds in Scotland outside, and I think there are still people that probably still curl outside on the ponds, but I think you need to see this garden to see just the majesty of the place and little Chinese bridge, all these different trees, little sculptures, the old Victorian folly, the walls. It's, it's just totally changes your perspective of that story of people curling and enjoying themselves after work in that area. I think you can just imagine how joyful it was and things. So, And what Sarah says is that it was colder in those days. In the winter, everybody curled outside all the villages. The square pond in Hercules Garden was the curling pond here. It was strung up with overhead lights so that the curling could go on after work. Mr Stewart, who was the estate factor, was a very, very keen curler. And I think he was actually the playing um, captain of the Scottish team at that point. So it's quite interesting that he practised just in Hercules Garden in Blair Castle. It's the most grand of places to practise outside, I think. So as well as the photography, um, as I mentioned before, I wanted the book to be something that could be passed, hopefully passed on to future generations, so that it could be a real way of documenting how Athol was and who the people were at this time, what they remembered, how far back they went. Like the stories, the furthest back goes about 1920, maybe because people would speak about their parents or so. So I think it'll be nice in years to come that they've got this little snapshot of how it is. And part of making it something that could be passed on was thinking really carefully about how it was printed and where it was printed. Um, I was lucky to be supported by Creative Scotland and Young Scott for this project. So that meant that I could search out Scottish printers rather than having to go down south or use an online printer or something like that, that would be cheaper. And in the end, I chose Bell and Bain who are based in Glasgow. 
I think they've got three printing houses in Glasgow um, and they could just produce this really beautiful um, hardback cloth covered book with the gold foiling on the front. And it's all environmentally friendly. It's like the abstract city scene as well. It was all printed environmentally uh, with environment in mind. It was printed down south at uh, a place called Sustainable Print who use a completely carbon neutral almost um, printing process. Most of the papers that they use are from carbon neutral sources. They have paper stocks that are made from like poisonous algae that if it had been left on the water, it would damage the creatures that are in the water, but they take it off and they turn it into paper somehow. Technology is amazing. <laughs> they have like leather, um, paper that's made from the byproducts of leather manufacture and things. So as much as putting together things are important for me, I also think it's really important about how we print it, especially in this day and age when every decision that we make impacts on the environment so much. So I think it was nice to know that I was going with places that were really quite forward thinking in that way. Um, and when it came to the design of the book um, from home, both inside and outside, I wanted it to be quite plain and almost like a blank canvas for the stories. I didn't ever want it to be something that would distract from the, actual, the important stuff, which was the written content, which was what people were saying. No, I didn't want to have big flashy colours and shapes and things because you would get distracted and you would almost, it would persuade your vision of how you're reading it and things like that. So that's why I've gone for quite a plain, but hopefully very readable layout. Um, you can see my narrative set here and then the interviewee's narratives here. So it was, I think hopefully that's something that I've achieved. I've, the book's really cheered people up, which is good. Um, because when I started it, I was really conscious of not just taking and not giving back, if that makes sense. I didn't want to just take people's stories and then totally just leave Blair Apple or something like that and just <laughs> make millions or whatever. But, but luckily, the locals have really backed the project and it's been well received here because a lot of them have said that they can almost hear their friends telling them the stories. And because we can't have each other in our houses at the moment, They've really enjoyed just sitting down with the book and just imagining it as a wee bit of company or thinking about the voices in their heads and things so yeah it was just a privilege to put it together and self-publish something during the lockdown it was a real good creative focus and it kept me going anyway I don't know if the lockdown helped it hampered it I think it probably still wouldn't be finished yet if we hadn't had the lockdown and hadn't just had full days to work on it so <laughs> but um so yeah that's me so thank you very much for listening and thanks for having me street level that's uh, very nice thank you Thank you, Julie. That was great. Really interesting projects. And um, yeah, I took down lots of notes and lots of questions um, that we'll come back to at the end. But it was interesting seeing two very different projects presented in different ways. So abstract cities, it's all about kind of the urban environment and it's this kind of low, lo-fi zine versus uh, from home being this kind of beautiful hardback kind of photo book so it was a really nice kind of contrast I'm sure there'll be loads of questions coming in about that um, at the end there as well um, so if you just want to stop sharing your screen we'll just hand over to Sean um, so Sean has been sitting patiently there in the background um, Sean Moravsky is a photographer based in Glasgow his photographs are primar primarily candid and reportage in nature um, and he utilises natural and available, available light. In 2010, he became the youngest ever photographer to make a formal portrait of the Queen. Um, so it's a great pleasure to hand over to Sean and hear about your publication as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'll just share my screen and also thanks for that, Julie. It was, uh, it's, always, it's always good to see other people making very, very different things from yourself. So uh, my self-published publication from earlier in this year was a small zine called Paquetto, um, taken from one of those uh, indescribable words in English, but one of those uh, words that they have, um, or one of those things that they have words for in other languages, um, comes from the Japanese word, to gaze vacantly into the distance without thinking about anything specific. And um, it's a collection of photos shot probably, not probably, definitely over a period of more than a decade. 
um, that sort of finally came to fruition, but I'm still I'm still shooting it. And yeah, the reason it was such a a natural project for me is because that's what photography is for me and always has been. It's these sort of moments and um, fleeting moments that are quite often gone by the time you've taken your finger off the shutter. Um, this image is this image is a sort of like cover image for the zine. And yeah, that's what photography is to me. Um, fleeting moments, fleeting moments that you just can't help but frame. This one was a wedding and it was in the grounds of a small castle and uh, there was a bouncy castle and kids all going crazy. And um, I think I was just taking a break from the job that I was there to do. And um, this, yeah, this little girl was comfortably lost in the moment to, who knows, doesn't matter. I li literally couldn't fumble enough quickly enough to take it because it was a hip fire. Um, it's just, for me, that's, it's like a perfect, a perfect opportunity, a gift almost of an image, because there's always so much going on in the world around us, especially in the past year. But in general, people are so distracted or attentive to what's going on around them. And you so rarely get an opportunity to just take somebody, take a picture of somebody, obviously, potentially without them knowing, but a picture of someone just being lost to their own mind in their own space. This was in um, the Metro in Paris. Um, and yeah, another hip fire when I was sat in the seat across from, um, when I was sat in the seat across from this man. And uh, I think I was just worrying at the time about how humid and how sweaty I was. And it's, I kind of feel like a lot of these images, there's only so much I can say. It was just me me having a chance to frame what was in front of me. And that's what Paquetto is. He's a series of moments that people are having to themselves that I was lucky enough to be there and, you know, um, frame that in some sort of way. This was on uh, the ferry to Arran. Um, my partner's gran. Um, yeah, just having a little daydream to herself with a little wry smile if you look carefully enough um, just having her tea on the lower deck and that's I keep coming back to this but that's that's all photography's ever been to me like fleeting moments that you're lucky to be part of and that's why Baquetto is is and was like the perfect example of that. People just so quietly overwhelmed that that you almost become quietly and no, quietly overwhelmed in their presence, and uh, you just take the photo while you can. But that's not limited to this project because this project is all images like that. But there's a common thread, like um, Julie eloquently said earlier from the from the quote that, you know, everything is the same. It's moments like that with absolute strangers or relative strangers or relative family that are meters away or centimeters away or people you went to school with that are lost in thought and that you've, that are actually very uncomfortable in front of a camera, but you know, you get that that brief opportunity or that brief chance to yeah capture something in their company um, where they're looking at you rather than the camera or looking at themselves or looking at nothing at all moments where you know everything else other than the image and the moment and the person fades away Um, this was in Florence, uh, 
with my Airbnb host, who was a much warmer and friendlier guy than this photo suggests. But I think this is when he was uh, giving one of his various philosophical life talks while cooking food out on his, um, I don't know, I don't know what he called it, but his balcony, I call it a wee veranda. Um, or a retired session bassist from Paris who was also an Airbnb host. It's an excuse to talk to a relative stranger and um, sort of curtail a portrait out of them. But those singular moments are they're not limited to people in formal portraits or informal portraits. You know, sometimes the moments are easier when someone's, you know, looking away or looking away or isn't even aware that you're there or it might even be, be between photos this was between photos technically for a photo shoot all those little moments that you're just that you're just there to frame and take because there's nothing else that you can do what else are you going to do yeah sometimes it's just because the person isn't looking because they're passing by in the street while stepping around you because they don't want to get in the way of their photo, your photo, not realising that they're in it and they're not looking. Again, this was on the Paris Metro. This was actually, again, a hip fire from a wide angle. So I think I actually feel social anxiety even thinking how close I would have had to be for this photograph. And it's, yeah, it's a strange thing when you look back at these photos, for me anyway, in that you become aware of how close you potentially were to someone, it seems all the more closer, especially if it's street style stuff for people that um, you don't actually know. That, yeah, the aim is always that moment, but to capture a little bit of someone in an empathic way or a human way for you know that you know nothing about that person but you're kind of hoping to grab a, a small a small moment a small memento whatever that may be um yeah if they're looking away even if that's a queen that's it's no different i mean it is different in in theory and principle it's a formal portrait but it isn't. It's no different. It's all, it's, it's all the same. It's all treat. It all for me has to be treated that way. It ha has to be that way because there's there's no other way to it. There's 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 people and whether they are conscious of you being there, if you're trusted enough to be that close to them to even have a camera. It's a position of power. It's a position of privilege. Whether it's the queen or whether it's someone who stood in front of you in a queue and you know, you're know you staring at your feet because you're distancing and you're waiting and the puddle frames it. It's, it's about those, those moments and what you do with them and how you, how you show them and how you capture them because it's, it's so important for me that it's, Everybody has their own slant and their own take on whatever they whatever they produce um, or make or create. And I wouldn't use the word art for me or artist. I feel like I'm just I'm a photographer. I'm there to frame the moment that if it's a moment that's worth capturing, then it's a moment that I'm I'm lucky that I was there in the first instance, you know. I was lucky that I was stood behind that person in that queue and the puddle was there. I was lucky that my headphones disconnected and I heard a knocking noise on a window that turned out to be a kid playing in their living room, I think. Yeah. I was lucky that I was walking through the park, the, you know, when the light was like that. It's, um, it's just framing the moment and what it means to you and, and framing it in a way that gives it the weight 
that it made you stop in the first instance. Sometimes much easier at a distance of the fog because people don't know that you're there. And that was in um, Queen's Park from the from the very recent um, the very recent um, fog that we had. And especially distance seems to matter so much more right now. We're so aware of it. Two meters further web chats. It's it's about closing that distance in some sort of way, but closing it in the most honest and empathic way that you can. Because you can only you can only frame it because if you put too much of your slant, you take away the opportunity for someone or something to tell you a story. Even if the story is just a nice patch of light as you're uh, pulling onto the motorway, someone, someone somewhere. Light, yeah, light in those quiet moments that sort of make you stop or catch you, catch you off guard or catch you off guard because you've always, for me, I've always got to be ready for them. Those moments that catch you off guard and you just see if you're re ready enough or you have enough of a reaction or a muscle memory to it. And you quite often spend, I do spend so much longer just looking at things than ever do taking a photograph. You do it, you quickly adjust, you frame it, and then it's on to the next one. As you can see, patches of light, especially for me, is, you know, that light's traveled all that way and then it's just reflected somewhere else so, so perfectly or framed at the last minute. And I always spend much longer looking at it than I do taking the picture. So again, from series of images, from sort of like the stillness and the quiet, and the you know that the fog brings. That was late at night, just close close to my house when I was walking the dog, and just. Yeah, moments, moments where you've been so quietly overwhelmed that you didn't know what to do other than to try and capture it or keep it in some sort of way. Because <laughs> what else is there to do? Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, it was really nice seeing both, you know, the contrast between both projects and and your approach as well, Sean, just to kind of photography in general. There's something I, I was going to pick up, pick up on what you said, though, you know, you were saying how so many of the photographs are, are about luck and, be, you know, just being and happen, happening to be in the right place. But I think, I, I think you're kind of doing yourself a bit of a disservice because it's also about being open and aware to these things happening around you and, and the opportunity to make pictures. I don't think it is just down to luck. It's about, you know, being in the moment as, as a as a photographer, having your eyes open and, and then, you know, you start to see these things happen. And I think it's a really nice record of different quiet moments that you've that you've captured and kind of collated as well. Um, so yeah, so we've got um we've had some really nice comments and, and questions coming in. Um, so please do keep putting them in, in the chat. Um, I don't know if, if you guys had any kind of comments or questions for each other. I know, Julie, you'd sent me a wee message um, with a sort of point for Sean, if you would put that to him. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you level with somebody when you're doing like a set up portrait? Because they all seem to have a great sense of empathy and you'd really, you know, it wasn't just, wasn't there was no awkwardness between them. Whereas I know when you're taking a portrait of someone, not everyone's totally open to it. So how do you kind of get them at your level and just get, how do you get the real them out of them really? Um, yeah, I don't know really, I guess. All I really do is if there is someone, because normally the person that you want to take an image of obviously comes before the, the moment of the image. It's not that it just happens and, you know, suddenly the camera appears. It's 
more just a case of if I find somebody interesting in that way, when it gets to the taking of the photograph, it sounds cliche, but I try not to take it any different. It's such a peculiar thing to be suddenly having a conversation with someone and there's a camera between you and them. But I just try to treat it as normal and as relaxed as I can and just talk to someone during it because it's, yeah, it's so hard, especially. I hate having my, I hate having my photo taken. It's, 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 it's a horrendous experience <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So it's just, you know, treating the person and the moment with the sort of the respect and the distance that it's easier for me because I don't do anything that's sort of set up, but explaining and trying to make someone feel like you're just there to get, you know, a photograph of like the time that you spent with them. You're not aiming for anything other than, you know, a, pho a photograph of them. So it's, yeah, just approach it like how you would like to be treated, although that's not fair in my case, because I never want a photo taken. <laughs> that's great. So there's um, a couple of questions that have come in during the course of that. Um, one is for you, Julie. So this is from Nikki Bird. She says, thank you, Julie. Really interesting, uh, really fascinating book work. What were the biggest challenges for you when editing slash putting, to get, putting the book together, both in relation to the photographs and to other people's stories and memories? Uh, thanks, Nikki. Um, it was probably for the writing part was just editing it down so that you weren't, I don't know, it was kind of hard for me to think, okay, when people are reading this that aren't from the area, how much do they need to know of this story and how much descriptive language do they need to know and how many of these little side notes that people are saying do we need to include or can we just kind of shorten it down a wee bit but keep the essence of the story? Um, I think that was quite tricky. And even as well, just thinking, okay, has somebody else mentioned that same event or is it good that they've mentioned that thing? A lot, something that a lot of people mentioned were the vans that used to come round, like the butcher van, the fish van, all this kind of stuff, the grocery van. That's something that basically everybody mentioned. So it was trying to think, OK, people probably don't want to read about these vans 25 times. So <laughs> how am I going to include that, but also not bog down the subject? Um, and in terms of photography as well, it was trying to find a balance between, because I was because I was more passionate about the photography rather than the writing. I felt more comfortable doing the photography. That was the first thing that I'd written at that standard of like actually putting in a book. Um, and I hadn't had any formal writing training, whereas photography is something that I've been doing for like over 10 years. So I felt a lot more comfortable. So my photographic library for the book was huge. So I was trying to find a balance of it not becoming a full photo book, but also not becoming too word heavy because needed to understand that we do still need to see things and how much is enough to be seen. So really it was always kind of thinking about trying to remember that there's people that don't know the area like we do and think how much do they need to know and see. So that was kind of what guided it and also trying not to make it like a huge encyclopedia. <laughs> I think that was one of the nice things actually, you know, when you talked about your initial plan of, of making portraits of people and then putting that next to the writing, but actually it feels like what you've actually ended up doing is you, you've taken Blair Arthur, you've taken home and you've kind of put it out into the world. So if you do have a copy of the book, you know, you have kind of Blair Athol at home with you. It's yeah. worked really nicely. I think it wouldn't necessarily have that same sort of appeal if it was just kind of the portraits and the stories. There was something kind of all, all encompassing with it. Um, there was something else that you kind of mentioned um, when you were talking about abstract cities and that was you know this photography almost being like a way of kind of centering yourself or like um, removing yourself from a scene so if you're feeling like kind of overwhelmed or anxious in like a, a bustle in place actually the act of, of making a photograph kind of taken away from that and I was interested yeah I, I wanted to know given that you come from kind of a, a product design background and not necessarily a photographic background where that interest and passion for photography came from in the first instance? I think my passion for photography was there way before my product design one. But I think when you're in school, we certainly didn't have any photography classes. There was an after school photography club that ran for like a month and then it stopped. There was nothing in the area. 
whereas product design I had you know we had classes at school it was uni courses that you could go to and we were kind of really pushed towards that so I think um, and with photography we, there was a little skills um, a skills share event in the village years and years ago I must have been about 15 or 16 at the time and there was a photographer and she had her work there and she had these beautiful pictures of flowers and squirrels and things like that and I said how do you get the fuzzy background but the sharp foreground <laughs> and she said and she got her camera over and she's like oh look look you put it onto this thing and she showed me the little macro setting and I think that's where it went from there because I couldn't I finally clicked my camera onto the my little compact thing onto macro and I was just like away in the garden all over it <laughs> um, so I think that's probably where that came from and I think that was really good for my development of seeing things because I think as a photographer you maybe see things differently but I think being in Dundee was really important because it was getting away from the rural environment and seeing that there are more things to photograph and I think that's why I find cities and things so stimulating because there's so much going on that yeah I think that really helped develop my interest in photography and things and then of course getting into film and just a big rabbit hole really. <laughs> oh great there was a couple of uh, a couple of different people actually have asked Sean about you know where the idea to make a zine came from and the, you know you mentioned that the pictures span like a 10 year period so was the concept of uh, a zine kind of tangible you know were you thinking about okay one day this will become something physical when you're making the pictures or was it just when you've amassed that kind of amount of material and how agonizing was it to try and split that out when you've got so um, much material to start with yeah um no, it was definitely an afterthought in that, you know, it's the images of the moments first and foremost. Um, it was something that was, a, it was a collaboration. It wasn't just me, like between um, me and um, my best friend, Stephen, who's a graphic designer, which made obviously a huge difference to the, the, the whole project in itself. But it was just talking about doing that. Yeah, I had however many photographs and various projects I'm terrible for projects and that I feel like everything's a constant work in progress and I don't realize however many projects I have until I realize I've been making the same image over and over again for like 10 years or however long so it was a, a, a case of that and then sitting down with my friend Stephen um, and he was and he said look do you have any projects that you think would work for that or that you really like or you want to do something with and then yeah, just pulling them all together. Um, I mean, it, it was and it wasn't hard to trim it down. I just having somebody that understands the way and the layout and the way that's going to print and can give you tangible numbers to be like, I don't think less than this will work and this would be too many. And then going with the right amount of things and being able to hand that over to him to then lay it out and then, um, you know, be presented with that um, yeah it was it was more of a afterthought but I kind of feel like everybody's got their their own way of doing it I, I like the way Julie was saying that you know having yeah having conscious thoughts or actions to why you're doing things obviously if you're documenting some sort of background to an area you go on with that but for me that was that yeah the opposite was true for that and that it's um if you don't have any tangible idea of how you're approaching something you can let that make up your mind for you and how that, that makes sense so yeah it was it was, it was, it was def definitely an afterthought and wouldn't have happened unless Stephen had uh, fervently but politely politely pestered me to do so and uh, done done the heavy lifting on the layout and stuff like that because I'm sure if I'd tried to lay it out it would not have it would not have uh, worked so well um, but yeah, yeah it was definitely an afterthought. That's an interesting point, actually, when you talk about layout, because looking at the different publications, that kind of, the actual physical design of it and different, you know, so, Sean, for example, in your in your publication, images are on different kind of coloured backdrops in the page, and, and Julie, you know, both the zine has quite a playful layout, and you, again, you talked about colour and, and the role that played in terms of making the pictures. I was just I'm wondering, you know, what sort of influence, you know, what sort of things influence you or, or interest you? You had mentioned, uh, Julia, about you know wanting to be able to go and see exhibitions and photo books, and a few people had commented on the kind of cinematic quality within your pictures, Sean. So just kind of interesting. What sort of you know were you looking at 
other works when you were laying these things out and coming together or were you just kind of focused in on what it was you were doing? Um, is, is that for me or Julie? <laughs> for, both, for both of you, for both of you, what kind of influences or, you know? On you go, Julie. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, I think it kind of changes all the time, really. Um, it depends on maybe even what music I'm listening to, what album artwork I'm seeing, and what I'm seeing on social media, what films I'm watching, although I don't watch a lot of films, but that, so I don't watch a lot of films, and that means that the ones that I do watch really stick with me because I'm really conscious of the cinematography and what's going on with them. Um, and I think colour has always inspired me and been an influence because whenever I was at DJ CAD, there was colour everywhere. And I just found it to be such an inspiring place. Even our studios, you would have like an orange wall and then a plain white wall and things like that. So I think it's all about where I've been in the long run, but in the moment, it's the things that I'm consuming um, visually. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that's interesting because obviously we come at it from a slightly different angle or slightly different backgrounds, but I feel, feel it's very similar. It's you would be very naive to say, oh, as much as I didn't have a conscious thought about it, everything's just like a, a big sieve. We're all consuming so much, and you know, sometimes it's very rare that I see something literally and I go, oh, I want to do exactly that. I feel like the best sort of form of whether it's inspiration, whether it's like cinematography or whatever it is that you see something. And for me, I'm like, that makes me want to go take photos, maybe of something similar. But um, but for me, sometimes weirdly, that can influence, I guess, what I think will be maybe would definitely inf influence like the final image or the final way that you frame something or do something. But I find for me, it's just, yeah, what, whatever I'm consuming, like I'm very visual in the way that I think, but I feel like quite often, whether it's music or books, like words and text, um, just in the very literal thing of words or text or in the context of that and just words and phrases and music. And I feel like more often than not, it's things, short instances of that, that I sometimes dwell on or, or think on that lead on to that quite quickly afterwards I end up wanting to, wanting to do something that has some similar common thread, but I feel like that 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 has has to be the case with everybody because you can't you you've got you, you, you can't lock yourself away from it. It has to be it has to be yeah your take or your angle or your slant on your understanding of everything whether that's literally you taking the photograph or something or looking looking at other things it's all it's how it all filters down and how you yeah how you how you deal with that um it's yeah it, it's funny how the more you think it's unrelated the more you realize it's all just intertwined yeah totally totally i think that's where we're kind of just coming up on the coming up on the hour and I think that's a really nice kind of point to, to leave it on. There's been a lot more kind of comments and questions so um, if you guys are happy to do so, if you want to take the time and just respond to people in the in the feed, the comments will stay up when the, uh, the video gets uploaded but um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much to both of you for two great presentations um, and two wonderful photo, you know, two sets of wonderful publications. I know that, um, Julie, your zine is sold out, and Sean, I believe your zine is just about sold out, but we are, we've, we'll be getting the some last, copies in the, the shop. When we the, yeah, the, the last copies of it will be in street level. Um, yeah, you, yeah. you have the last copies of it, so yeah. So they'll be available when we reopen. And Julie, your From Home book, that's still available through your website, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yep, yeah, still on cool. there. So um, yeah, so if any, anyone does want to pick up a copy of uh, that beautiful book, highly recommend it. Um, and all that's left for me to do is just say thank you to you guys again, and thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having thank us. Thank you, thank you. It's good Cheers. fun. Thank you.